Welcome back, everybody. My next guest tonight is a 60 Minutes correspondent and author who has been reporting on Washington since 1995. Please welcome back to A Late Show, John Dickerson. John, thanks for being here. Good to be with you again, Stephen. Now, uh, John, the last time you and I were talking together was because uh, you had released your new book, The Hardest Job in the World, which is a history of the American presidency and how it has become nearly an impossible job to do. Um, so I think you're exactly the person to talk about how this now affects the job and the politics of the moment. Um, it's only October 2nd. How many more October surprises can we expect to get? Yeah, well, I mean, when you think of all the other, when you think of the tax story, that was an October surprise that hit in September. Now this one hits at the beginning of October. It's, it's you know, we, do, we look at the polls and they have not responded to some of these huge shocks to the political system, but this is quite different. I mean, this is the number one issue at the center of American life, and the president is now both responsible for the response, and he is now a patient being treated for it. Can you think of anything historically that is comparable to this moment? Not this late in the... I mean, there are certainly presidents who've been sick, and we can talk about that, but, there, but not something that's happened this close. To, I mean, there are 32 days to the election. The voting is going on now. The president has raised questions uh, and encouraged his supporters to raise questions about the democratic process. There's a Supreme Court uh, a nomination going on. The pandemic is still going on. So nothing that has been this critical and had this much going on all at the same time this close to an election. So in some ways, the, the way that uh, Trump uh, being taken off to Walter Reed and is, is sort of par for the course this year. It's, it's one of the most 2020 things that could happen right now. It is, although you could say him getting coronavirus is very 2020. And but what struck me about seeing the president in the methodical steps of getting him to Walter Reed wearing a mask, which we don't see him often doing, the protocol and, and everything that is kicking into place is, it's impervious to spin. It's not like everything else we've seen. It's not like the stuff in the campaign, which is all about shaping the environment and the narrative. This is the methodical steps to get a president well, because it's that serious. It sort of goes back to what people have been saying for the last seven months, which is COVID doesn't care what your party is and COVID doesn't care how the Senate votes. COVID doesn't care how you want to position this message. COVID is the message. Exactly. COVID waits for no man or woman. It is coming and it is relentless. And we have seen in the president's response to COVID um, a constant effort to play down uh, the risks of it and his his uh, public health officials have been pleading for people to not lose sight of the fact that COVID does not stop. It continues. And so you've seen that tension for months going on, I mean, on all different kinds of issues. And you've seen it on this mask question. And now we're not thinking about it just theoretically. It has, in fact, come to pass that the president, who has not shared that view that his advisors have, now is having to go through special treatment. Uh, and it's all, you know, very up in the air as we try to get information about what, in fact, his condition is. So there are five weeks till the election, thereabouts. And two of those weeks, the president will not be able to be out on the road campaigning. What does this do to the race? What are the consequences for both of these campaigns? Because obviously this has to change in some ways what Biden is doing. Well, it Yes, what it did at first and is it interrupted with a pleasant return to some norms that we might have thought were gone, which is that, uh, that Joe Biden and a lot of other Democrats wish the president well. They basically spoke in human terms about the president and his health and, and, and prayed for it. That interruption, however, which is, you know, that's an assertion of a norm. Um, and in these time of shredding norms, it's nice to see them reasserted, but the campaign continues. And what this will do is two things. One, it will keep the story focused on the very thing the president doesn't want the story focused on, which is the pandemic and his handling of it. 65% of the country think he's done a poor job. He's been working very, very hard in everything, including the debate this week, to, to change the topic on anything but COVID. Now it's at the center of the conversation. He's kept uh, in these constrained conditions, which means he then can't go out in the country and change the conversation to something else. For months now, the, the Trump campaign has been going after Joe Biden and saying things like he is sitting in his basement, alone, hiding, diminished. And, and much of Trump's 
message, just not just now, but throughout uh, his political career and before that, is the idea of strength. The, the fact that he's presently at Walter Reed, how is that going to change how he can campaign against Joe Biden even when he comes out of it? Well, already it, it makes those past statements and the president's statements during the debate in which he made fun of Joe Biden for wearing a mask, his family members who didn't wear a mask at the debate, in hindsight, those all look foolhardy. Uh, and, and again, this is not some frivolous thing. This is the central issue where 207,000 Americans have died. And it connects with a central critique of the president, which is that in downplaying the virus, whether it is with respect to his own health or the health of his family or wearing a mask, connects with the policy response, which has been to downplay, which has that huge result of the hundreds of thousands of Americans dead. So the president will no doubt, as a clever politician, try to do something to make uh, something positive of this. But to the extent that it connects with the number one thing he has been trying to avoid and makes it a personal part of his story, which was going to call, call for endless hours of coverage, it'll be very, very hard to surmount that with some kind of uh, athletic act of political gamesmanship. Well, let's talk about the um, constitutional responsibilities here. Now, we saw the president walk out to Marine One and walk off of Marine One. Um, he seems as steady as ever. Um, he's wearing a mask. There's no overt sense that he's compromised in any way. At what point is the 25th Amendment invoked? Like, when would uh, Mike Pence be asked to take any responsibilities? Well, there are a variety of different triggers. The way it's been triggered most recently, I mean, there's, there are ways in which you can trigger it without the president's consent. The president has given consent twice when, when George W. Bush had a colonoscopy and went under. Dick Cheney was president briefly. That happened also. That was the case with with uh, with Ronald Reagan. That could happen here. Um, but one thing that is important is that while there are protocols and a rule manual for handling those things, this is a stress test of the White House operation, of the whole team. And, and, and that means not only dealing with handling the president's illness and informing the public, but the to-do list that was there that he's not maybe going to be able to handle in his condition, or that at least will be harder for him to handle. You have to have a good team in place to do that. You can't just figure that out on the fly. And it's why so many White House veterans say building a team, having a team that works together is so important because this is the kind of surprise, although this is an extraordinary one, that faces a president. I, I read about the necessity of building a good team in the White House. It's in a book called The Hardest Job in the World. You should check it out sometime. It's pretty darn good. Do you have a copy? Yes, I do, right here. I have... Um, available at uh, bookstores near you. It's an excellent gift for whatever holiday comes up next. Now, um, I, I have to say, when I saw Marine One take off from the White House lawn to take the president away, and even though he does his chopper talk frequently, we never see Marine One taking off in that shot. When we saw that shot and the camera follow it over the Potomac down to Walter Reed, we associate that shot from with January 20th, the day the president leaves the White House for the last time. What was your emotional response when you saw Air Force, I mean, Marine One taking off? That's right. You, they don't hold the shot. Normally, okay, the president's off to go do whatever he's going to do. But in this case, the journey itself is the thing that's interesting. And so they hold the shot. What struck me about that moment was we are watching in real time the president be cared for. Um, there is, there's lots of presidential history of presidents basically sneaking away and not telling the truth about how sick they were. Obviously, Wilson had a stroke in office. They basically hid that from the country for months. Uh, John K well, Eisenhower had a heart attack. They told the reporters it was because he had too, much on too many onions on his burger. Um, uh, Cleveland went away and got jaw surgery on a yacht for four days and wore a fake mustache to hide it. The tradition has been to hide these things. So while the information coming from the White House has been uh, you know, a, a little bit spotty, watching it happen in real time is quite new, um, and 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 presidents can only sort of protect this information uh, uh, as much as you know, and not very much in the in the age of everything being filmed. John, we have to take a quick break, but stick around, everybody. When we come back, I'll ask John about how this may affect the confirmation hearings for Amy Coney Barrett. We'll be right back.